through the Spirit of Santo Amen. Celebrate Saint Augustine. Behind every successful man or person, as the case might be, is a woman. God so made it that we all came through a woman. Even God himself, in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, came through a woman. 600 years before Christ will come upon this earth, Isaiah, prophet, saw it and say, a virgin will conceive and bear a child. The Israelites, right from the time they began to operate in the temple, began to preserve young ladies from the ages of seven, some say three, to prepare for the virgin that will conceive. They never knew that this virgin would conceive without the instrumentality of a man. So when it comes to the age of 12 and 13, these virgins in the temple were married out. And that is how Joseph was chosen to be the one to take Mary in as a wife. For Mary grew up in the temple. The prophecy was being fulfilled through Our Lady. And that's why when the angel Gabriel came to visit her, in her house, when she was already betrothed to Eve, sorry, betrothed to her to Joseph, our lady asked the question to the angel, how can this be when I will not know man? That's a better translation. Because herself and Joseph have planned to serve God who the Israelites are waiting for. Mary and Joseph are preparing to be the servants the handmaid of the parents of the promised Messiah. They never knew that this prophecy would be fulfilled through their union. So if Mary was to have children, courtesy of Joseph, she would have asked that question. Because the angel said, you will conceive and bear a child. So this is very, very important that we should know this. Mary, before her pregnancy, was a virgin during her pregnancy was a virgin after her pregnancy was a virgin that's why we call her the blessed ever virgin mary now why am i giving you this story i said earlier on behind every successful person is a woman god has made it that way and our lady have not only lived out her role as one who will ensure that all her children are saved, but she was able to give birth to the Savior of the world. No one can go to the Father except through Christ. And no one can go to Christ except through Our Lady. That makes it very, very interesting. So how do we know this? We know this by the role Our Lady played in the life of not only her son, but also in the life of the early church. And so the early church, which was being persecuted, most of the popes in the early centuries were martyrs. The apostles were martyred. Christians were martyred. To be a Christian was to be martyred. What does it mean to be a martyr? It means that one who is ready to die for what he or she believes in. And Mary was there to ensure that the early Christians not only held on to their faith, but were ready to represent Christ wherever they found themselves. It so happened that during that period, there were so many teachings going on, just as so many teachings are going on in our own time. And these teachings they are very, very dangerous to the faith. Christ handed over the true faith to the apostles. And the apostles handed it over to those who we are going to continue after they begin to die. But there come some people who began to teach very wrong teachings. Very sensational teachings. 
these sentimental teachings, they begin to make all kinds of stories about the life of Christ that were not true. This we call heresy. Any teaching that goes against what Christ has handed over to those who truly want to follow him is called a heresy. And these heresies we are spreading wide. And young children, young boys, young girls, young people, they are all following some of these strong teachings. And they are distorting the image of Christ and the teachings of Christ. One of these teachings is called Arianism. And this Arianism was carried out by a priest who says that Christ is not God. And it's so, it's so terrible in that period. For almost 300 centuries, 300 years, for almost 300 years, that's three centuries, I beg your pardon, many people followed for the Arius. Even 90% of the church during that period followed for the Arius and his teachings. It was so terrible. And these teachings started all the way from the time where they started believing that Christ cannot be God. Why? Because of the things that he himself suffered. That God cannot have a son. Because God is almighty. Now listen carefully. If Christ is not God, which was their teaching, then Mary cannot be the mother of God. We call Mary Theotokos in Greek. That is bearer of God. That's when it started. Destroy one teachings of Christ, you will destroy the rest. And that's why we must, as traditionalists, guide against false teachings. These teachings started spreading so well that even the young Augustine, the young Augustine, who God has blessed with intelligence, was able to fall for this kind of teaching. At that time, they called their own Manichaeanism, whereby you need to have some sacred knowledge, some sacred knowledge for you to communicate with God. Christ in his teachings was very plain and simple. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You don't need a sacred knowledge for you to serve God. Christ has come, Christ has shown us the way, the truth, and given us the life. But the Manichaeans, we are saying, you need to go into different steps for you to get illuminated, for you to get the light. So a special group of people, denounce women, denounce property, and you live like that, and all those you have false teachings. And it continued like that, as the Augustine was caught up with that. Two things happened. At that time, there was this great priest in the person of St. Ambrose, who was the Archbishop of Milan. St. Ambrose had already converted from his own false teaching because he was a great man, was a great rhetoric, one who was able to lead the land of Milan to a greater height. And so he became a bishop and he was preaching the truth. When Augustine encountered him in the city of Milan, he told Augustine, because Augustine was asking the question, what is truth? And how can I find the truth? So Ambrose told Augustine, you do not find the truth. The truth finds you. And that becomes very, very important. At this time, as I was telling you earlier on, behind every successful man is a woman. Every successful person is a woman. So Augustine's mother, in the person of Monica, was always praying for the conversion of her son, Augustine. She prayed for the conversion of her husband, and she also prayed for the conversion of her son. At this time, Augustine was doing all the bad things you can think of. He was, this, he was a thief, he was a proud person, he was a womanizer, he was a drunkard, 
but he was very intelligent. God blessed him with intelligence, but he was not wise. He conquered the academic world of his time. It was a great victory. He knew the sciences. He knew how to analyze things. He knew how to carry out the law. But he was not wise because he hadn't Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, all your wisdom is nonsense. And the mother was praying and praying, praying always. When St. Ambrose witnessed the mother praying, and the mother went to meet St. Ambrose about her son, she said that this son of yours will one day be converted. He encouraged her. And so it is, Augustine now began to find the truth. Or the truth now found Augustine. And Augustine now converted and became a great priest, a great bishop of Hippo, and a great theologian. He is known in the Catholic Church as a doctor of the faith. Why? He was a great sinner. He was a great bishop. He was a great saint. A great scholar, a great saint. Now, this is how it happened. After Augustine got converted, some young people came and met him and now found what they call the Augustinian order. He gave them a rule that they can follow to live the holy life. The Catholic Church recognized Augustine as the doctor of grace. And this grace was gotten for him, courtesy of the prayers of his mother, who never ceased praying for him. You too, be you a young boy or a young lady, be you a mama, a seminarian, a priest, a reverend minister, you are expected to pray. Pray for the conversion of sinners. For the past two weeks, you have been going around East Africa. For the other seminarians who came away from Philippines, for the bishop from Australia, he has been going around to see how he can bring these people back to the true faith, to the true mass. We need your prayers, and you need to also pray for the conversion of sinners. There are many people who want the faith. The faith. For the past so many days, they have been traveling. We went as far as Kisarian in Kenya. We went to Nairobi. We went to Kisi. We came down to Ndeje in Kampala here. We went as far as Masaka. We went to Kabale. And there are lots of people who want to stand for the true faith. Some of them have been chased by their bishop, by their priests, because they want to bring in the Arian heresy into the church. Because the Arians, they say they would not accept Christ as God. And so the Arians are the first that started administering communion on the hand. They begin to treat Christ irreverently. They begin to bring this false teaching. One of the false teachings that St. Augustine himself fought against is called Donatism. Because he was a very bad person before he became converted, the Donatists feel that if you are a sinner, you cannot become a priest, you cannot become a bishop. They criticized Augustine on that, and it was a great debate. <coughs> and they are Christians. We all know the story of the prodigal son. We all know the story of the woman caught in adultery. We all know the story of Christmas, the one crucified with Christ and Calvary. We have seen so many people, almost all the apostles, they are converts to the faith. We know the story of St. Paul, who was, late, who was formerly Saul and became Paul. We know all these stories. So how come that St. Augustine was a bad person and now got converted and the Donatists are saying that one needs to be holy for one to carry out the sacraments. Yes, you need to be holy. But the sacrament itself is not of you. It's of Christ. And Christ is holy. You see it now. There are two words in theology. If I'm teaching you theology and I've taught you, I'll call it, call it for you now. Ex opera operato. Or ex opera operantis. The very sacrament the priest is carrying out in the church is holy. It does not depend on the holiness of the priest. It's expecting the priest to be holy. Even you, you need to understand this. 
so that you can allow the grace of God to work upon you. And it's why we need to pray for our fellow brothers and sisters so that they may constantly be the state of grace so as to receive God's blessings. But for the clergyman, he needs to understand that the prayers he offers in the name of Christ and his mystical body of the church is always holy. It's always holy. As St. Augustine won the day against the Donatists. But till today, we are people who feel the purity of everything should be the way out. And this we must try to avoid with all vehemency. It's good for us to be in the seat of grace, but please and please always carry out the sacraments in the way it's supposed to be carried out. And in that way, the sacrament itself is holy. It does not depend on the holiness of the carrier. Because the sacrament itself is holy. So Augustine was the one that did the debate and won the day because of grace. And that's why the church calls him the doctor of grace. The doctor of grace. And he was able to gain these graces courtesy of the prayers of his mother. So, mothers and fellow traditionalists, let us keep on praying for our fellow brothers and sisters. Our Lady of Fatima said, Many souls go to hell because there are no ones to pray for them. Let us do prayers, do penances, make preparation for the restoration of the true faith and morals. So that like St. Augustine will be converted and make heaven. And the poetry is a feeling that's spiritually sound to Amen. Amen.